and the aforementioned John Everson via telephone. John, good morning. Gentlemen, good morning. How is everybody? Excellent, thank you. Great to have you with us. Oh, I, hey, I feel like, you know how you guys oftentimes with Phil, you start with uh, some pro football talk. Sure. <laughs> while, while I'm not the biggest pro football fan these days, I was as a, uh, as a, a child, uh, however, this is the equivalent, I think, of calling Earl Morrill in from the very end of the bench <laughs> to put him in for Phil McCoy. So I'm delighted to be here. Yeah, I was at the game years ago that Earl Morrill came <laughs> in. He did a phenomenal job. Which game, game would that have been, Bill? Uh, is end of the regular season, was it uh, – I don't know. What uh, team was he with? The, uh, the Dolphins. Oh, okay. Yeah. Bob Greasy oh, broke Bob his uh, – Gre Bob Greasy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah Moore, Earl, Earl Morrow was probably – and this is one of those backhanded compliment kind of things, the greatest backup quarterback mm -hmm. in the history of the NFL. And, you know, he spoke when the Apple Harvest Festival used to do its sports breakfast. He was mm -hmm. one of the speakers one year, and I was the MC and got a chance to introduce Earl Morrow. Just a great guy. Yeah. Yeah. Really, just a phenomenal gentleman. And that had been 74, 75 when that 72 happened. 72. Yeah. 72 was Yeah, because that was the perfect okay. season. Yeah. And he's, he's the one that saved their perfect mm -hmm. season. Uh, John, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit of money here, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Since that is your specialty. I was going to say, it's one of my favorite topics, so go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, we've talked about this with Phil in the past, but uh, maybe we can get into a bit more with you. We've got a presidential election coming up in November. Yep. And two drastically different candidates. How much of a factor will that be as they begin campaigning in earnest after Labor Day and we get to a November election in terms of the direction the stock market takes? Does it matter one way or the other? Yeah, that's a great question. In fact, i got to give you credit. That's probably the most commonly asked question in our building here on Winchester Avenue uh, that we deal with these days because, you know, it's, it's a curiosity that most people have. And maybe this is the advantage of, of having a really old guy here this morning, because if you think about it, I'm in my 39th year uh, with this firm. And so I've been through more than a couple of presidential elections. And so what's interesting about it, when you go back and you look at it, and, and, and it's interesting, oftentimes no matter which side uh, a person leans in terms of their personal belief, whether it's to the left or the right, or they try to stay in the middle. Oftentimes, you can create justifications for, well, this party would be better because of these variables, or that party would be uh, better because of, of, of those factors, and so forth. And I'm here to tell you, because I've, I've actually looked at this a lot over the years, and I've experienced it, it oftentimes it, it has very little impact on who has control of the White House, who has control of the Senate, who has control of the House, uh, and presidential election years tend to be relatively, from a performance point of view as far as stock market and so forth, tend to be relatively benign. And what I mean by that is the existing administration is doing their best, in effect, not to rock the boat, because the last thing they want to do, sending people into the, uh, uh, to the voting booth, is to have them um, upset because you know portfolio values are down, their 401ks are taking a beating, and so forth. So they're doing the best they can to kind of keep smooth, glassy water in front of us. You know, the the other party, the party that's trying to uh, you know displace uh, that incumbent, is doing everything they can to try to make the water seem choppy and so forth. But for the most part, typically uh, presidential election years are um, uh, not. Uh, extremely volatile one way or the other and uh, they tend to be uh my experience relatively benign good answer yeah yeah uh now once a president is in power I, i've done some research on this to find out uh, does a republican president or a democratic president lead to a better stock market through the course of their uh their time in office and a lot of it has to depend with who has control of congress john yeah it, it does very good it, it, and that yes because when you started when you started your question there, Rob, what I was about to say is you got to be careful because it's not necessarily the party of a president, but it's the party of a president and then the alignment of uh, of Congress. Okay, because oftentimes what you get is you wind up with, and this really is interesting. I've got some uh, some charts that actually uh, depict many decades of stock market performance for different asset classes and such, different styles of, of, of assets. 
And at the bottom, it will show, you know, uh, whether the, the presidency was red or blue, whether the House and the Senate was red or blue, and so forth. And when you go back and you study that, what you actually, the conclusion you walk away from is nobody, it's very rare that someone gets the opportunity to have something totally lined up where basically everybody, in theory, is thinking the same way. And so as a result, that's why I often tell people, you know, uh, as I like to, to remind people, while I have uh, personal uh, leanings and uh, uh, individual philosophies and so forth, here in the building we try to be as apolitical as we possibly can be because what we've seen is, and I've seen this going both ways, <clears throat> people who are, you know, say, for example, who may be real conservative, Oh, if, if a Democrat's going to be the president, then, you know, I want to cash out of my investments and so forth, and, you know, I want to move to cash. Well, that eventually proves out to be a bad idea, okay? I've seen it going the other way. That eventually proves out to be a bad idea. We actually have uh, some folks right now. We have a, 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 a gentleman who moved out of equities back uh, probably six months ago for fear that uh, Donald Trump – would become the next president. And here's what's almost ironic about it. If you go back and you look at you know, uh, the, the first Trump presidency uh, from uh, you know, January of 2017 going forward through uh, what would that have been uh, 2021, January of 2021, financial market performance was actually quite good, even despite the fact that we had that pandemic sell-off for five and a half weeks in the late winter, early spring of 2020. So oftentimes, that's why, again, we, we have to be as apolitical as we possibly can, because if as advisors even we allow our, um, uh, our beliefs to creep into how we're going to help somebody structure something, we may very well wind up uh, leading them astray as opposed to uh, trying to stay, you know, as I like to refer to it, straddling that double yellow line right in the middle of the road where we're, um, we're still participating on the upside. Billy? Yeah. Uh, good morning, John. Uh, the market is considered to be overbought. Uh, is there a downside to that either for the traders or the investors? Yeah, you know, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, the, the issue, the challenge with that when you get into those kind of conditions <clears throat> often is, <coughs> excuse me, it, the challenge becomes, you know, it, sometimes it doesn't take much to set something off. In other words, what I mean by that is, you know, as, as, as prices continue to rise higher and you, you start to climb this wall of worry, it doesn't take much, you know, it's a very small linchpin sometimes that gets pulled that then becomes, okay, now all of a sudden you've got this, uh, you get this emotional response to those kinds of events and because people then have the perception, well, you know, we were, uh, we were overpriced anyway, therefore uh, we should come down and so forth. And again, for people who have well-designed, uh, very diverse portfolios, usually those kinds of events become, uh, if you keep them in context, they can be managed pretty effectively. Yeah, along that line, kind of picking up on what uh, uh, Rob was asking earlier, uh, supposedly the stock stock market's having its best year, best election year since 1976. Uh, what can we contribute, contribute that to? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think uh, part of that, uh, I believe, is a, uh, a carryover still from uh, where we uh, from the year that we had. Uh, I started to say the year we enjoyed, but I can't use enjoyed in 2022. For those that remember, 2022, and it was was one of those was one of the roughest years we've had in a while, because what made 2022 uh, so unique was it didn't matter what kind of an asset class you were in, whether it was equities, whether it was fixed income, bonds, whatever. At the beginning of 2022, if you held uh, assets in cash, yields were extremely low because, you know, interest rates had not moved up. Of course, you know, everybody remembers 2022 was the year where the, uh, the Fed became uh, super aggressive with regard to uh, raising interest rates. And as a result, you had this combination of factors. So equities don't like inflationary time periods because inflationary 
uh, time windows are, are bad for corporate profits, okay? Um, you then had the Fed trying to take the moves to, necessary to kind of keep inflation at bay. That then created, you know, almost a perfect storm for bond-based investments. I've always described it as opposing ends of a seesaw. When interest rates go up on the one end of the seesaw, the other end has to go down, and the other end is the price of already issued bonds that are out on the prevailing market uh, at, at the current time. And so, you know, uh, you know, it was one of those, those years where it was very unusual, and that's one of the reasons why I think in 2023, while we had a pretty good year, and, and, and it's really interesting. If you go back and look at 2023, if you looked at that year from January 1st to, to uh, December 31st, most people would come to the conclusion, even on a diverse portfolio, hey, we had a really good year. But when you broke that down and looked at that further, the conclusion you came to was we had a really good year from January 1st through July 31st. Then for 90 days, from August the 1st through about Halloween, we got beat up, particularly on the equity side, pretty hard. And then beginning November 1st through the end of the year, it was almost as if, okay, never mind, you know, here we go again. Because what had happened in, uh, in August last year, inflation basically you know, was proving that, you know, to be, remain very stubborn and, you know, had, had uh, kind of creeped up. And as a result, you had this knee-jerk emotional reaction to things that caused this massive sell-off. So that's a really long answer to what was a simple question. Here's my point. I think 2024 is still kind of a continuation of, of a lot of that recovery going back to that started in 2022 was such a rough year, and it's uh, kind of 2023 still carrying forward, uh, carrying us uh, forward through where we are right now. Mr. Gilstrap. Morning, John. Um, Morning. I, several ways I want to go on this. I, I think I'll just go pessimistic because that's that's my want today. Uh, okay. Sometimes I wonder if we're not just whistling through the past the graveyard, you know, and so oh, there is a question at the end of this, but I want to set it up with this. You know, yeah. we're the we're paying two million dollars a minute on interest on the debt in, in the United States. Um, so much of this booming economy, certainly the booming stock market is being funded by people who are buying things on credit that they can't afford. Uh, we heard the other couple of weeks ago that only 30% of Americans can actually put their hands on $1,000 right now. Yep, I've heard that as well, yes. So if people uh, are getting nervous that perhaps, you know, a, a crash is inevitable, you know, it's like we, we've, there, there's there's no foundation under all of this. If, if a customer were to come to you with that pessimistic outlook and say, look, I, I don't I don't want to just have it all go away. What do you tell them? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. <laughs> and interestingly enough, we've met those people. I'm okay? sure you have. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't do this for almost 40 years and not having uh, run into a couple of those in uh, in that, that window of time. So one of the things that, uh, is, and that there's there's a variety of, of, of components, um, you know, in terms of how, how you would respond to, to that kind of an issue. First thing ultimately is going to be, Again, just a reminder that we're going to be building something that is uh, very diverse, number one. Number two, we remind people of the time horizons that money needs to have. And we recognize and realize that, that money has at time uh, different time spans on different pockets of money. So, for example, uh, if let's say if someone has – uh, someone who is a uh, uh, say a freshman in high school right now, and they've got some money saved for for college. Well, they probably really need to start taking a, a, a little more conservative approach to those dollars because they're only a couple of years away from beginning to need those resources. Someone like myself, for example, I'll be 63 in uh, October of this year. Money that I would be using toward the end of my life, I'm still going to have a growth-oriented outlook to that. Because I do have the expectation that I'm going to live for a number of years. So even as I like to refer to it, even 90-year-olds still, when they go to the grocery store, they still buy green bananas. Okay? Because <laughs> the point, the point being, you know, if they want, if they plan to be if today's Monday, if they plan to be alive on Friday, well, guess what? If they buy all ripe bananas on Monday by Friday. Uh, Phil McCoy is the only one who likes bananas that ripe. I don't, okay? <laughs> and so so that's why I, I will buy a couple of green ones because I want a, a yellow one on Friday, not a, not a brown one. 
So, so diversification is the first thing. Second thing is that we would do is, as you start to build a portfolio and look at, at some things like that, are to, uh, uh, to design things where even if, if equities are appropriate, uh, you may go in, uh, take the dollar volume that should be allocated to uh, that kind of an asset class, and we will break that up. So let's say hypothetically, if, if there was going to be, uh, say, a couple hundred thousand dollars allocated to something like that, we'll break that up. We'll put some of that in maybe as a lump sum so that if things do continue to improve and move forward and, you know, things remain like, like you know, fairly normal uh, type performance, we're going to participate in the upside. The other thing we then will do is take – that remaining balance will park it into such, usually some kind of a cash account and turn around and dollar cost average back into that equity-based investment. So that as if things do in fact come down, we're now buying cheaper than what we used to. And I'm going to use a term that you used, which sort of makes the hair on the back of our neck stand up when we hear it, when things crash. Okay, so if you happen to have a large sell-off where we're down 20, 25, 30 percent, I've experienced a few of those in my time. Anybody who's sitting on cash at those, that point in time where we, we're still dollar cost averaging out of that pool of cash, those usually become really good opportunities to buy into a, a uh, deeply discounted market at that point. And so, again, it all ties back to the time horizon that someone has to work with, the diversification, and how do you actually design and structure uh, uh, the portfolio. Final comment, there are today – different kinds of products that in some instances will build, you know, can put a floor underneath of someone, okay? Now, uh, you know, because there, there are a lot of alternative products that have become, uh, come onto the marketplace, uh, again, because of the fact that I've been doing this for so long. When I first got into the business many years ago, um, financial products were simple, straightforward, pretty easy to understand. Today, they're becoming way more complicated, way more complex. Uh, simply because there's, there's a variety of all these hybrid products that are now being built that are designed to provide perhaps upside performance with downside protection. So, again, you, ha you have to look at those. In some instances, there may be an appropriate place for something like that in a portfolio as well. Yeah. Uh, John, uh, we, we tend, as the market grows, we tend to get more and more nervous. And I think John Gelskrap alluded to this. Yeah. One of the real darlings recently has been NVIDIA. Uh, yes. And it's been going up skyrocket. Right? The CEO of NVIDIA has recently sold nearly $100 million worth of stock. Uh, does, that, does that have any impact at all on the market as a whole? Or people discount that? Or what, what effect, if any, does it have? And please keep in mind, yeah. John cannot comment individually yeah, on stocks exactly. in terms of whether yeah. you should buy them or not. I understand that. Very, very, very good. That's where I would Thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what I was about to say, what I was about to say is when it, somebody hears something like that, uh, what I always suggest is try to look at that at a deeper level other than maybe, say, the CEO and so forth. Ultimately, because it is public knowledge, when you are a, uh, uh, a senior level executive with a publicly traded firm, anytime you execute a transaction, uh, that is public knowledge. It has to be disclosed. Now, if you happen to come to the awareness that you know a lot of people in the boardroom are selling, uh, you may want to pay attention to that. Okay, oftentimes what you'll notice is you may have someone who is selling, and I always put this into context because someone, let's say, who's selling a hundred million dollars of of something, well, if they've got five hundred million dollars of the position and they're selling a hundred of it, put it into context. It's maybe not that big of a deal, and it may not be a sign really of anything. There may be you know, nothing to read in the tea leaves in terms of what that means, okay? But you do want to look at, you know, what are the other uh, senior executives doing, those insiders, you know, and, and oftentimes what you'll find is a lot of times uh, insiders, sometimes they may be, um, and this is really interesting because when you look at this, sometimes you'll see uh, some insiders buying, and ultimately what they're doing is oftentimes is exercising uh, options that they've been granted. Others are selling, and you know. But at the same time, just because you know someone is selling the stock doesn't necessarily mean that they're 
reducing their holdings. They may sim simply be exercising some options that they were holding, and they're simply going, not going to retain those shares. Uh, they you know, just want to retain you know, the ownership level that they've got. So I think you have to be careful when you do look at uh, uh, things like that because um, you know, sometimes that, that it, it, it can be misleading sometimes. John Everson, our guest here on the program from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad's Group of Financial Advisors. John, uh, we've got about four minutes left here. I want to talk about uh, traditional IRAs versus uh, Roth IRAs and the same oh. with how that breaks down with 401ks. Uh, if you were young enough and, and you had the option, is there any logical reason why you would not select the Roth option? Uh, so, Rob, i got to give the disclosure. You may be talking. Uh, Phil, Phil McCoy and John Everson may be the two most uh, uh, active and proactive Roth proponents that you're ever going to meet. <laughs> yes, so, indeed. <laughs> uh, yeah, simply because. So I, I'll give you a simple analogy. I may have used this on the radio with you guys before. Imagine for a second I didn't do this for a living. Imagine I was a, a, a farmer and corn was my crop, okay? Which would you rather pay tax on? The seed going in the ground or the corn that you're going to harvest? You get to pick one. So if you think about it, if I take a kernel of corn and I stick it in the ground, and I do that, let's say, for you know, a uh, 50-acre field, uh, I expect more than a kernel of corn coming back to me, right? The field that, where I've planted those kernels of corn, if I pay tax on the, 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 the seeds that I'm planting, that is the equivalent of a Roth. And if you think about a single from a single seed of corn, you're going to get a stalk's going to come out. It's going to have several ears on it. Each ear is going to have many, uh, you know, uh, uh, kernels of corn on those ears. All of that, if that's in a Roth, is totally income tax free. Versus, I took my tax break on the seed. I got a tax break on what I put into the ground. And I'm now going to pay tax on whatever I harvest out of that field. And again, assuming, you know, good sun and rain and, you know, uh, proper growing conditions and so forth, I expect a harvest. Then it comes back to which would you rather pay tax on? Now, having said that, let me make this comment. We actually did have someone in here the other day, a gentleman uh, who's uh, become a client, a recent client of ours, where we actually told him take advantage of as much pre-tax stuff as he possibly can. Single individual, highest tax bracket that is, uh, exists to an American taxpayer, uh, makes a, a lot of money on an annual basis. He fully expects his income at some point in the future will go down. Therefore, for most people, that notion, you'll be in a lower bracket when you retire than you were when you were working, for most people, that's a myth. And, I've, again, I've got 40 years of, of experience that, that I can say that. For this guy, uh, he's actually in a higher bracket now, maybe than what he will be down the road. Therefore, we need to defer and take advantage of the traditional 401K and those, those types of, uh, of avenues. But the younger a person is, the more advantageous that Roth does become because you push those dollars over decades of time with a decent investment strategy, and it is, uh, it's powerful the uh, tax-free accumulation that you can pile up. I always appreciate a good food analogy, John, and you didn't, <laughs> you you didn't disappoint. We've got uh, 60 seconds left. Go ahead and plug the firm and tell folks so they can get in touch with you, John. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Marius Group, uh, basically our mission is we help change lives for the better. That's uh, why we're here. If we can help somebody, we're more than happy to, uh, to talk to them. Uh, our office is located at 1270 Winchester Avenue uh, here in Martinsburg, West Virginia. Uh, phone number uh, for the office is area code 304-263-4343. If you call the office, the likelihood that Phil or John is going to answer is unlikely. However, the folks that do, uh, they control our calendar. They'll be more than happy to, uh, to talk to you and uh, get, you, uh, get you on the calendar. And uh, it, if we can help somebody, we'll tell them that. If we can't help somebody we'll tell them that too and we'll try to point them in the right direction great stuff john thanks so much appreciate you doing this absolutely gentlemen have a good day you too thanks john thanks